thank you everybody for uh, tuning in. This is our uh, conversation with Phil Elvram, uh, Mount Terry, the microphones. Thank you so much for joining us today, Phil. And um, it's Hello. me, Jordan Knight, on this end. Um, yeah, how's it going, Phil? Great, great. Thanks for having me. No, absolutely. Thank you for, for doing this for us. What are you, um, so what have you been up to? Um, we haven't heard from you in a while um, in the music world. Oh, well, uh, I've been doing stuff. I guess it's been kind of quiet. It's been a little bit since I've released a new thing. Has it? I've, <laughs> I'm confused. I, yeah, maybe I've been working on like retrospective things. I, I put together a microphones box set and that took a while. I spent a lot of years working on this big book of um, my former wife's art, Genevieve Castre, and she was a an artist. And so I put together a comprehensive book that took some years. Um, but no, I've been making records and touring a little bit, more or less. I'm recording right now. Oh, fantastic. Um, what are you working on? Yeah. So, sorry, you cut out there. Could you oh, say sorry. that again? Oh, yeah, what are you recording right now? What kind of music? New songs, new Mount Erie songs, mm -hmm. like writing and recording a new album. But, you know, it's slow. No timeline, really, for that. I'm just sort of working on it as it comes. Absolutely. Do you think that's changed after COVID? What, recording? Yeah. If recording has changed? Recording, is it, do you find a different, I mean, sort of post-COVID to how you were recording before that? No, because I've always just recorded myself alone at home. So it's not really a social thing. It's um, not going to studios and stuff. Probably for a lot of people, it has changed though, but not for me. Absolutely. How do you feel like that's changed your interaction with the music though? I mean, if you're the one pressing record, playing all the parts, how do you, how does your connection change? Do you think it affects your connection with the music? Well, I don't know, because it's just always been that way. I've never done it any other way. So that, as a teenager, I, that's how I started doing music. I guess a lot of people probably start that way. I just never changed. <laughs> so I don't know. Yeah, there hasn't been a change, really. It's still very much like a going inward type of internal solitary process of there are little periods of collaboration and sometimes playing live is about collaborating with other musicians but in terms of like the genesis of the music and the origin of the songs it's very much a inward facing thing how, how are you finding playing live right now um sort of post-covid sorry about that uh it's been good i haven't yeah i did a tour it was a year ago now but pretty big tour of the u.s and some shows in spain and uh I guess it's different. It's people are more excited to go out and more a little more like thirsty for stuff after being shut in for so long, but didn't feel that profoundly different. It felt a little bit like, oh yeah, I know how to do this. Uh, this is like an ancient memory that I'm dusting off. Yeah. We did you miss that during COVID? No, that touring thing. Kind of. Yeah, I kind of did, but not so bad because I had a pretty full life, uh, just like parenting and living. It, I also really like the domestic version of life. I think I'm kind of split in a not one of those people that like really is fueled by lots of tons of social interaction. So um, it was kind of fine for me to have to be shut in and just like read books and cook food and uh I, you know, people say that kind of thing, and it sounds a little bit cocky, maybe, to when so many people in the world are suffering <laughs> from it. But uh, yeah, it, it wasn't that hard to me. Um, so you mentioned uh, creating the microphones box set. Um, so what drew you back to the microphones, and why? Uh, like, has this changed your interaction with the music you've previously made? Having to revisit it now with everything that's changed and how your life has moved. Yeah, yeah, it it's kind of um, well. Since I've always just made this music on my own, and it's had different names, but you know, like it was called the microphones for a while, and then I started calling it Mount Erie, but fundamentally it wasn't actually that different. It was just the same project with a different name. So I always thought it was a little bit of an absurd distinction to really put too much weight on that. And I had been doing these Mount Erie albums for so many years. And then in 2019, how did that start? 
I just started writing a long song that was like thinking about, oh, wouldn't it be weird if I wrote a microphone song now out of nowhere? And what would that even mean? I, I didn't want to like play old songs. I didn't want to like try and reenact the past in a way that would feel disingenuous. I wanted to think about, can I embody that old version of myself now in an authentic way? Um, so I started thinking about that and writing writing in that vein and it just sort of grew into this one super long song that I ended up calling Microphones in 2020. And it was not uh, like a reunion or it wasn't like a coming back out with a new thing. It was more just like looking at the whole situation in a kind of a deeper way. And then after that, I was like, okay, now this microphones thing is done. I can like punctuate it and cap it off and put it all in this box set and put it on the shelf and move on. And so that's the reason for all of that. Um, if during COVID, I spent a lot of time just doing archival work because I was in the house and I was, I'd moved across the country a couple of times and just had all this time inside to go through the old boxes and sort of through the past and kind of think about is any of this stuff worthwhile? What's significant? So that it kind of grew out of that. Very satisfying. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And you mentioned the um, microphones in 2020, which obviously you did not release on Spotify deliberately. Do you intend to do the same with your with the music you're currently writing? I haven't decided about that. Hmm. Uh, it's like an unresolved problem that is, uh, I don't think a solution is coming anytime soon. Yeah. But with microphones in 2020, it seemed like an easy, uh, an easy answer because it was just one track, and so I would be like effectively giving away, giving away the whole album for nothing, because mm -hmm. because the whole album is one track. Even though, even if it was 20 tracks, it's still effectively giving it away for nothing because the pay is so extremely low. Anyway, I, I don't know. I need to think about that one. Mm -hmm. Do you think, um, I mean, is there a hope for Spotify changing its model or is that just part of the model of streaming, I guess? It's part of the model of streaming. I, I don't know if there's hope. I, I hope that there is. I think that it's possible, but I'm not really like in the trenches with that work. Mm -hmm. I, I know some people who are more involved in like the back end of legislation and changing licensing payout laws and lobbying the government and blah, blah, blah. But it's... um. I can't go that deep into that realm because it could absorb me. Also, I, I just don't have that kind of brain to do like le policy work. Yeah. But yeah, I think it's possible. It just would require like a lot of people being disappointed and customers having to pay more money. There's not like an easy solution other than that. Yeah. Um, do you have any advice for up and coming artists who uh, Spotify and streaming are a lot of the the main ways that these artists are coming up so i mean you already have an established you know fan base that you know is searching out your music whether you released on spotify or not yeah i know i know i wish i did have advice um i it is a, totally a privilege to have sort of gotten my momentum rolling in an earlier time when it was just a different situation i i wish i had a clearer idea of like what i would do if i was trying to get started now because it's my my initial answer is like oh just like take stick to your ideals and take the high road and and be stubborn about it but i know how much suffering that entails and especially now it's like worse now than it has ever been but it, in a way it's kind of always been that way for artists to stick to their ideals and not do things in a way that just doesn't align with their their idealistic vision of the world, if they have one. Um, and for me, that has served me well, I think, to be stubborn in that way. And I, I have struggled a lot from it in the past. So I don't know, for me, from my perspective, it's like, it's worth it to try. But I can also see that to tell a young person who's just like trying to get any exposure that they can, that sounds harsh. That's harsh advice. <laughs> And um, I mean, Spotify isn't the only, I guess, the only way of, of people getting out there right now. A lot of people are using, I mean, I assume you're familiar with TikTok, um, the app for um, where 
obviously you can add a little bit of music to make like a 30 second video is that is it worth i mean what what are your thoughts on that is that any better than spotify for exposure is it no no i mean we say spotify sort of as shorthand for all streaming services but they're all effectively the same in fact i think like youtube pays even less than spotify and apple music pays a little more but they're all they're all it's a, just a bad business model and we we've been living with this reality for so long that all this stuff is so cheap or next to free for people so to go backwards and be like wait just kidding no it actually costs money there's like monetary value to this stuff that's gonna, that's like a bitter pill so yeah absolutely it's, uh, yeah i don't know yeah um and obviously a lot of people are using spotify not only to get their music out there but to discover new music so spotify has these features where you can like i don't know d- discover five new bands a day or whatever um, and previously, I guess people were using the radio for that. Do you think that, and obviously from our perspective as a student radio station, do you think that radio is still relevant and is it still worth keeping around? Yeah, definitely. I think that there's something deeply creepy about an algorithm that's rec- deciding your recommendations. I think that it's uh, it's a bummer to see it becoming normalized. And not just the radio in the past. I mean, it used to be like you lived in a community of human beings that were recommending it trusted friends who were like, oh, you like this? You check this out. Or here, I made you this mixtape. Or it's easy to get hung up on how quaint all the technology of it is, like a mixtape or a CD or whatever. But effectively, like a human being that you know, uh, having a friend that's a human, there's it's a bummer to have that be replaced by an algorithm. And it's true. I've seen how Spotify works. I've like experienced it like wow what's this cool song that it knew i would like it is really effective but also it's unsettling i think that it's worth pushing against absolutely do you want your question um yeah so let's change it up a little bit um so in your music you've used a lot of unorthodox ways of instrumentation um could you kind of explain your writing recording process when it comes to like the experimentation of sound such as like pushing a piano bench across a wooden floor or falling and tripping over <laughs> instruments yeah well i don't know i think it comes from just being come coming at it from the perspective of just uh, being spending a lot of time alone in the studio and thinking of sound as, I didn't have that many instruments uh, and I never have had like a huge uh, arsenal of, of instruments. So, but lots of sound ideas were in my head anyway. So it was more a matter of like, what could I get close to this sound that I'm hearing in my head using what's around me, pots and pans, the piano bench, whatever and thinking of the sound of the world as all being valid musically and also just not wanting instruments to sound like themselves oftentimes that's sort of like a the default mode of doing things it always has felt more artistically fruitful to uh, try it a new way to, to like twist it if possible so it's all just experimentation and following the idea and you, you, um, when you're sitting there by yourself in the studio, do you ever get writer's block? And how do you deal with that? Yeah, yeah, it's. I'm still getting better at that. Um, I found finally, and like 44 now, finally figuring out that when there's writer's block, it's better to walk away, <laughs> to yeah. to take a break, to mm-hmm. to shift my perspective somewhere else, and then come back to it, and it usually clarifies itself. I used to just like bang my head on it or get really existential about what it all means. But yeah, nothing is so urgent that it can't be paused and pushed to later. Where does the songwriting process start for you? Is it with lyrics? Is it with a feeling, a beat, a melody? Where does it start? It's always different for for every song, but lately it's been with an idea in words like a lyrics I guess is kind of but even before they become lyrics it's more like an idea a phrase or like a a kind of a concept that I'm like oh I wonder if I could say that in a song and it usually comes from walking around by myself or you know having not listening to music just being having emptiness having 
open space for a long time. Meditating helps just like clearing out space for then an idea to arise. That's been the case for a few years now. So do you ever get inspiration from other music or is it mainly that feeling of emptiness? Oh, definitely I get inspiration from other music, but I think mostly musically that mm. for the word ideas, it's, I think that mostly comes from this sort of in, internal monologue. Yeah. Um, but musically, music, uh, musically, definitely it comes from all the music I listen to. And lately, like, uh, my daughter is eight and she's really into pop music. And so we listen to that a lot. And that's been really inspiring too. Just listening to Lizzo or whatever, like Taylor Swift, to just um, uh, Britney Spears, it, just Miley Cyrus, like all this stuff that my daughter's into, it um, seems fun to try and do the thing that they're doing. Not be a pop star, but just like musically build songs in that way. It's not that different from what I'm doing. <laughs> well, how do you how do you listen to your music? Do you use Spotify or are you are you more of a sort of physical music kind of person? We listen to records a lot in the house, but I I do have a um, Apple Music subscription that I keep meaning to cancel. <laughs> that that's what I use to put on like the pop music that my daughter is exploring. In regards to records, what do you think of the recent uh, record revival within the younger generations more recently? Um, do you think that has a chance of becoming more wide stream or is it more isolated? What do you think? Uh, it's I think it's temporary, but I'm um, I've built my whole business model around it. I mean, I, I still make vinyl records as and I still think of them as like, this is my really this is the thing I make. Yeah, sure, you can listen to it on a computer or a phone or whatever, but this is the actual thing. And um, I I really like it. I know that it's maybe, I think it's temporary because it's not sustainable just for the planet. It's like this big honk and piece of plastic and paper, and it's like this petroleum product. And if we zoom out a little bit, it's like not the good mode to last, but for now, it's it feels so good to have, make this tangible work of art. So, I mean, in, in your opinion, are, are we? What's the what's the ideal way of of sort of consuming music? What's the ideal way of listening to it? Is it digital? Yeah, yeah. But, good question. I I have I'm pulled in lots of different directions. I think I'm like I have this sort of. Um, uh, and maybe antisocial, like we all should just gather around a fire and like sing to each other, yeah. primitive. And then at the same time, I see how like corny and quaint and unrealistic that is. And I could see like, oh, well, it's actually so practical for music to be streaming and for in a streaming model, ideally people would be compensated fairly for their, the stuff that they make and, um, both of those are ideals and they're also opposites. But I, so I have to have two answers for that one. Fair enough. Um, and I mean, what's your, I'm sorry to keep dragging onto this, but what's your sort of views on, on Bandcamp as a software? I know a lot of up and coming musicians prefer to use that um, in order to get sort of relatively fairly compensated. Um, do you yeah, I love it. Yeah, and today is Bandcamp Friday, it which is, is yeah. And that means that Bandcamp doesn't take their cut of the fee for this day once a month. It's, they're awesome. I mean, they're, I keep waiting for like, it seems too good to be true. And I keep waiting for like something bad to happen, but it's not happening. That It's a good model that lets musicians um, set their own price, what seems fair to them. And people can give it away for free if they want to or whatever, 0.001 of a cent. That's, but yeah. most people recognize that they need to pay rent and eat food so they set it at a regular price and yeah. the money goes to the art it's great it's really um a direct model and um i mean i, I guess and another uh, so recently a lot of musicians i think like tom morello and stuff said the um into sort of combat this 
uh, the issue with Spotify, um, they released NFTs, um, which sort of came and went. And a lot of mm-hmm. people seem to think that, I mean, on one end, a lot of people seem to think that that was how artists get fairly compensated. And on the other end, people thought that it was completely pile of trash. It was terrible for the environment. It was terrible for um, for artists and for consumers. Um, I want to know your opinions on on that as a sort of way. Yeah, I missed, I kind of missed that whole thing. I mean, I... <laughs> I never really wrapped my mind around what it was and I'm glad to hear it's over. Oh yeah. (laughs) So you've mentioned that um, a lot of the inspiration for your music lyrically, at least comes from the expanse walking around in nature. How does the nature, um, your home walks, like how does that affect your music? And do you think it has a pres like a present character within your music? Is it personified in any way? Definitely has been in the past o- over the years. I I try to get away from like personifying the natural world too much anymore because I feel like that's trying to, yeah, that's like a comes naturally that way, and I am trying to look a little bit deeper than that. Um, I don't know what my music. Maybe this isn't what you asked. I'm answering as if you asked what my music is about, <laughs> but um, yeah. No, it's definitely a present, a presence, like nature, quote unquote, nature has always been there in my songs. And um, I've kind of wrestled with how much to like embrace that or, or push against it, because I feel like the risk of having it be too naturey is like, oh, you can kind of pigeonhole it as just like, wistful, back to ancient times type of thing, which seems more superficial to me. And I I actually want to be writing and, and thinking about all, all of our interactions with wildness and the natural world and like this kind of the unknown that has nothing to do with if there are trees or if there are parking lots around us. It's more more of a experiential thing. Mm-hmm. So it's just that in my case, I I live kind of surrounded by trees and that's what speaks to me and that's the vocabulary that I I use yeah and obviously you, you write a lot about i mean in, in some cases your personal experiences and i guess i wanted to ask does do you feel a sense of catharsis in in right in getting that down and, and performing that kind of material yeah definitely it, yeah especially you, you might be referring to like a crow looked at me yeah. or these more explicit personal songs about like yeah witnessing death and grief and the domestic details of that um for sure catharsis is a huge part of that very useful for me hmm. um what else do I ask? um i guess <laughs> um i mean this is completely unrelated to any, anything we've talked about yet but um so you've you you have I think a, a large fan base in what I call the like music nerd community, which is sort of the and I, I don't mean that in a in an at all a sarcastic way. It's the um sort of like music discussion community. So you had a an interview with the music discussion society a few years back um at this uni as well, and I guess I I wanted to ask what are your experiences with that kind of um I guess online music discussion community. I avoid it. I mean it's. <laughs> Well, yeah, wouldn't you? It, it Just if it was like about you, it just would mess with your head, right? So to me, it seems mentally healthy to not dip my toes in there because it would just spin me out in my own self-perception confusion. I just have to like make the thing I make. And I very much appreciate it that people are into it and like have stuff to say about it, <clears throat> but I have to leave it at there as as like salacious as it would be for me to read that stuff Fair enough. i guess it definitely is a dangerous game how much feedback you take um so how has your interaction with the audience changed from the beginning of your career to now um could they have a lot more access to you now with the internet so how do you maintain boundaries and how has that audience interaction been affected oh i don't I don't know if they have more access to me. Do you mean, uh, I think it maybe it is common for artists to 
feel more accessible because of the internet. But I, that might be just artists who participate in social media a lot. And I don't really do that. So I don't feel like more exposed than, than I used to. And I actually do really like interacting. I love like selling merch at my shows. Um, I would never give that up when I, I've occasionally played at like a festival or something where they don't allow artists to sell their own merch or they like have a whole, and that's always just been like, ah, I hate this. I, Cause for me, that's a huge part of it is I make these objects. I take them around. I sit behind a table, I play a show and I like sell them to people. I, I have this sort of retail exchange and a hello. And it's so gratifying to, um, to put faces and, and hands like, you know, to like, it's so tangible to me that's so crucial it would be it would be sad to have it be faceless if that went away so do you think social media kind of reduces that i guess personal interaction is it less real to me it is i don't know yeah to me it seems like a synthetic version of a human interaction it doesn't hmm. it doesn't work for me it probably works for some people but it just to me it feels it feels hollow enough i mean is, is it worth for artists to sort of i mean is social media helpful for new artists in your opinion oh i'm sure yeah yeah it's it's a huge deal i think that that's whether whether i like it or not that's where the community is that's where society exists and grows so yeah i'm not and i use it as a tool i use it as a mailing list or whatever it's important but it's so easy for people to confuse like authentic human emotional interaction in that space. And it, I, I think it's pretty clear by now we see where that leads. It leads to lots of like empty feelings and existential depression and stuff and lots of people. Right. So. I mean, has that any, in any way like influenced your music or how you approach music? uh social media depression <laughs> yeah that kind of i mean social media like we'll go with social media <laughs> no not really because i i i was like more active on twitter for a while there but that was it i never really had the other ones and um even when i was active on it i was more of like a uh not a consumer of it but a an a speaker, a, a content poster. I just like say my joke and then like get out of there. So no, yeah, it hasn't ever really been that big of a part of my life. Um, I guess, uh, yeah, I mean, you, I guess earlier you mentioned, um, sort of fatherhood right now. How do you, I mean, it's a bit of a personal question, but how do you balance, um, I guess music and art, uh, as well as being a parent? Yeah, it's tricky, but she, I've been doing it for eight years now. She's, um, I just do it when she's at school or asleep. That's just what it comes down to. I, I When she's around, I'm like, it's difficult to for me to get in my zone. I require sort of a lot of quiet and space for me to be able to do the music stuff or even to just like write an email. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Which one did you find more difficult, parenting or, or art? Hmm. That's an interesting question. I they're similar. They they don't, I, I find neither of them that difficult, really. They're both they're both sort of just kind of going with the flow. And then they require a lot of letting go of um, my intentions and just letting things take shape. Oh, fair enough. Absolutely. Um yeah, well, I think we're roughly out of time. Um, but thank you so much for doing this with us. We really, really appreciate it. Um, we're an independent student radio station. Um, so this meant a lot for us. Uh, we're, we're very big fans of your music. This will go up on YouTube and Mixcloud, um, shamefully. And uh, yeah, uh, it'll also be available, I think, via our website. But um, yeah, we'll really appreciate it. Um, we want to say thank you to Phil Overham. And um, yeah, I think that's goodbye from us. Thanks very much. Thanks for having me. Yeah, Bye. Thanks so much. Goodbye.